Feature engineering, it is one of those black art ninja data science tricks that the masters use to raise the accuracy of their model, whether it's a neural network support vector machine, XGBoost, whatever, and get better accuracy. Now, feature engineering, I've definitely used this particular black magic in kaggles of my own. You can see here in the core of question pairs, I got to a top 7% ranking. And I did this not by throwing crazy amounts of compute power at it, but just looking at the data, using my human intuition, and understanding how I can take the data that I already have, recombine it, and create additional features that give additional lift to the model. Now, feature engineering is nothing more than taking that input vector of your data set that you're given. Here you see cars and picking out a couple of these that you want to recombine in a different way. For example, let's just pick horsepower and displacement of the engine. We can then combine those into a ratio where you're dividing one by another. A ratio is one of the most often touted ways of doing feature engineering, and that gives you a new number that you then augment onto the data set and use that to then train your model. Now, you, we don't want to just randomly throw ratios and all these things around. We need to think about this if we're doing this using data science intuition. Let me show you how you can take these formulas and build them like Legos and know what to combine to engineer your features. Look at this cartoon, it's great. It's by PhD Comics, and I feel like it really captures feature engineering. I don't think that's what it's even attempting to do, maybe produce a very small model. But this shows you how you would assess whether you wanted to go to a particular seminar or a conference if you're in the corporate world. Maybe another team wants to show you something cool they've been working on, and to get you there, they lure you with food. So these are the three inputs. And to make it more simple for your model, the human mind, in this case, to grasp, we use that formula to combine these relevance of the information, food quality, and how far away it is, all three very important things to decide if you're going to go to a meeting or not, and reduce those, kind of like feature reduction, it is feature reduction, to one particular value that's now going to go into the model. And you'll probably still send those other three. And it'll be correlated, so you have to deal with that in, in models that need that dealt with. But that is how we've been using feature engineering for a long, long time, to make things, multiple variables, work better for the model, in this case our mind, so that we can think of them better. Square feet, square meters, if you're looking at a property, a flat area of ground, you're going to multiply the width times this little length. That tells you, rather than thinking, okay, it's this wide, it's this, it's this long, you just have square meters and you're done. But maybe taxing authorities always throw curveballs into this. Maybe taxes are more if you have more street front. So the width becomes much more important than the length. So you square the, the width or multiply it by something. It doesn't really matter that you're squaring it, cubing it, or multiplying it by a ratio. That's for the model to figure out. You're just giving it a hint. You're pushing it in the right direction. Another example of simplifying things sort of for the human mind is medical. If you're looking at how much does somebody weigh, their mass, you're looking at how high they are, their, their, their height, height. Those are two values. Mass alone is not enough to tell you the person's real health. That's what BMI, body mass index, is for. So you need a way to combine those. We have this formula here, and that is showing how you can put those two in relation. Now, height, that's not saying that height is necessarily so much more important than the mass. Those two values are in different ranges. Mass can be much higher compared to the height of an individual. So that's just kind of bringing that number. You don't want this, if the number is for human consumption, you don't want it necessarily exploding into very, very large numbers. You don't want to have to talk about, you have a BMI of 32,100 and whatever. So this is just looking at some 
basic examples of how feature engineering is used, not just for our minds in these cases, but could be used for a model. Now let's look at how to build these. So here are your Lego blocks to work with. I divide these into really four quadrants. First, you have your normalizer, which is division. That is used often. I mean, think of averages here. You don't know really how well somebody did on a test based on how many points they got. It is points divided by the amount that is on the test. So now you get this percent. You know what 90% means. You don't know what I got 90 points are. 90 points out of what? 900 points? The next quadrant is combine. Combine is when you have two values and really they're, they're working very much together. So you would add them together, you would multiply them, like the length and width looking at total value of a property. Like in the seminar appeal, the relevance and food, pretty similar kind of additive to each other. You can combine things with addition, with multiplication. If you want to go completely crazy with powers, if you're raising something to the power, though, make sure, I mean, you're going to have very large numbers that you're going to probably have to back back down some other way. Then the third quadrant is scaling. Maybe you want to take individual values as you're building this Lego block equation together and you want to increase or decrease its importance. Now you can use a division here, just divide something by a value and that decreases it. But more commonly, you'll probably use a power to increase it. So square something, cube it. You might use a constant to multiply it, which is sort of the same as dividing it. You would use, say, a logarithm or really like the, the big O notation in computer science. There's all kinds of modifiers to control how much you want to signify the importance of something. Heck, if you want to make it really important, take the factorial of it. It'll, it'll grow quite rapidly. And you can use radicals, which are really powers, but like the square root and other things as well, because that also controls how fast something is going to grow. Now, the fourth quadrant, you're contrasting. So if two things are working sort of in opposition to each other, you could potentially be dividing them, but if you're subtracting them, then you're, you're, you're dealing with one thing sort of as the baseline of another. And you might want to look at only the magnitude. Maybe negative numbers don't matter because which side do you put the two values on on the negative, the subtraction? So if you put an absolute value around it now, it's only the magnitude that is going to be important. You can also just square the quantity. And that's another way that commonly these equations are set up so that you're taking effectively an absolute value. And then often you'll put a radical around the thing later to sort of back that out. Some of the root mean square and other error calculations are good examples of these. So now using those building blocks, let's look at this comic again. You've got relevance times food quality. So those two things, they're both important to you. You're looking at the relevance and you're looking at the food quantity. Now maybe food quality would be more important to you, so you might square that one. Or you might have another value in here, which they allude to in the final frame, how hungry am I? When have I last eaten? You may actually then do food minus the time that you've last eaten. Something such as that. But relevance and food quality is trumped sort of by distance because you're lazy and you just don't want to walk very far for this free food or this information, the relevance. So you divide the whole thing by distance. Okay, you're really lazy, let's square distance. Or maybe you're worried about those distance units overwhelming the units that relevance and food quality are in. You don't have to worry so much about that overwhelming factor always with the models, sometimes they can figure it out, but I have done adjustments when I'm creating these and combining these together 
that helps it be able to figure out how to build that feature. So here's one that I put together. These are the values that I had. I had the value of somebody's house, the average value of houses in that zip code, and their age. And I was feeding all three of these into the model separately, and I was trying to predict kind of a score on affluence or their interest in buying a particular product. A propensity model is what these are usually called. So these values, I was looking at a way, how can I extract something out of these three? Because I think they work together and then put it in with all the other. And I had quite a few other features that were also going into this model. So what I thought about is, okay, the house value, what zip code are they in? It might be a very expensive house, but they're in Beverly Hills. So that's really impre impressive. Or it might be not as expensive of a house, but they're in the Midwest where I live. And then a lower house value might be impressive. So I did a contrast. I took the average house value and the house value combined them by taking house value minus average house value. So if you're below the average, that's going to be a negative number. If you're above, it's going to be a positive number. And we're lo really looking at just how much you differ by the average house value in your area. I don't want to put absolute values around that because it's important whether you're above or below that average. That's part of what I'm tracking. But then another thing you'll tend to notice in data is as people age, they trade up, they buy different houses. Not always, but on average, you'll have a bigger house as you are older. Maybe not bigger size-wise, but it'll cost more. So that's why I then took the whole thing divided by age. I'm now doing sort of a normalizer. And the units are different here. The houses, I mean, if I'm dealing in US dollars, the houses will be, I don't know, 100,000, 200, 300 in that order of magnitude, whereas the age is going to be 100 and below or slightly above. So that I squared the age to give it some size against the, the house values that I were subtracting. And this became a feature that I was then able to calculate. I don't really care what this value is. It's not like I'm looking at it like BMIs. It's just another piece of information that I am giving the model along with all the other socioeconomic information. And it lets the model then have less to, otherwise the model has to figure out how to synthesize and create these formulas on its own. It's information in a more pure form that the model can deal with. Models are inherently mathematical. So do they really need us weak humans to be doing this feature engineering for them? Well, what I continue to read about in Kaggle competitions, they, they tend to. But this was something that interested me. So I wanted to take a look at really what types of formulas would be better to be engineering for these models. So I did a research paper a few years ago that I published. It's also gotten a number of citations, so it's been useful at least to somebody. And what this, what this paper looks at, I'll probably do a video about it in the future, is I took a bunch of different formula types, took those 16 or so, I believe, and created data sets that had just random data. And I looked at how well can these various models interpolate values, so synthesize these equations. I'm just asking them to pick values that are right in the range of the values that I gave it. These types of models don't typically extrapolate well, so I didn't give them anything outside of those ranges. And I looked at for neural networks, random forest, support vector machine, and gradient boosting, how well, how low of errors did they really get synthesizing all these various equations? And you can see the results here. There are some real differences. So the different model types are not always creating the best of models when this math is not performed for them. Thank you for watching this video. I hope this was a good crash course in feature engineering, at least the approach that I do when I'm doing it completely from hand. 
I typically just look at my data, see where my model is predicting very accurately and not so accurately, and I just look at how can I engineer additional values that will really segregate those confusing rows that it's just not predicting that well on and maybe give it something that will give it a bit more lift. It certainly has worked in a couple of the Kaggles that I have worked on, particularly for tabular data. This doesn't work so well for image data because it's not like you're dividing one pixel by another pixel. All right, if you find this kind of thing interesting, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. I'll be definitely talking about more things feature engineering because I find it to be a very fascinating topic.